pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for putting together such a nice event. And I'm sorry I missed yesterday. There were great talks I would have loved to hear, but I was teaching game theory to MBAs until 5 o'clock in Chicago. So I just escaped the storm to get there. So um, like Eric, I grew up on the Book of Luz and Reifa. Not just me, everybody around me in the U.S. and at, at, in Cornell at the time, and later when I arrived to Israel, a whole generation of Israeli game theorists who grew up uh, on that book, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to discuss it. I took seriously the description of the organizers that this should be a talk of where have we come since the book, where are we going, and so on. So if Eric said that his talk will be less technical, mine will be much, much less technical, unless it, until we get to the end, maybe, if I have time. So uh, let me apologize first because I'm, I'm going to put things in perspective. And when you try to put things in perspective, it's, it's good to sort of summarize and say things that are probably obvious to many of you just to frame our way of thinking. So it's much of what I'm going to say is not new. Much of what I'm going to say was learned in discussion from people in this room. Uh, and some of it may be controversial, which would be beautiful if we can argue a little. Uh, but I, I think it's still useful. So let's start with the definition of a game, just to uh, everybody would, I don't think it's a big deal, right? So a game is an interactive environment for players with different information and objectives, take individual actions that affect each other. I can maybe, so you, maybe you would write it slightly differently, but basically it's an interactive environment. People have different information. People have different incentives, uh, and they interact and affect each other. And when you think about this, this is a huge, this covers a huge number of situations in economics, in political science, in, 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 in computer interaction, in biology, you name it. I mean, it's just how to imagine situations that don't fall into this of interest, situations of interest. Uh, so I actually find it quite surprising that somebody can say anything in generality about something which is so broad in terms of applications. Uh, and because of this, I think it's not surprising that the subject, once you realize that you can say some things of generality, starts attracting such a large variety of people who study this. So what we've been seeing over the years is people who studied from rational behavior, which was probably the beginning, I think, uh, but you see p p psychological, physiological now, mathematical approach, engineering, computer science, and so on, all of them taking to study games from their different points of view and tools and so on. So let me refer to the study of games. I want to call something the study of games, but not just game theory, not just the rational study. The study of games, let me call it game science for lack of better name. And let's call people who study it game scientists. These are people who study games. Uh, and obviously, at this point of the development, there are lots of game theorists, but a growing number, maybe there are more, more, more game scientists who are not game theorists. But it's a very growing industry, as I can tell from what I, where I sit. So I try to summarize. Where are the areas of activity today? Uh, and the first two areas, of course, are the standard ones, the non-cooperative the non -cooperative and the cooperative game theory. The growing number of studies on empirical and historical studies. So people try to fit gas war between gas stations into a Nash equilibrium in the, in the real world. Uh, people go and do historical studies of game theory. What is, what are, what are allocation in Spain? And see, does it fit into game theoretic models? So these are empirical and historical studies. Very growing area I just, uh, of uh, behavioral theories. These are people who study game theory in the lab, see how people really play, not necessarily the theory, or people who do surveys on the web and questionnaires and things of this type. Evolutionary theories became very large in more than 15 years or so now, really very broad. Algorithmic game theory and artificial game theory this, I think, is really, I mean, I see it coming up. There's dozens of, uh, at least a dozen game theory conferences among computer scientists a year now, much more than a dozen. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I think that 20 years from now, the influence of computer scientists on game theory 
will be at least as significant as the one that we had from economics because they bring into the subject all kinds of aspects that we were leaving out, complexity, computational issues, and things of that type. So that's a very significant area. Interactive epistemology, that's a subject of interest to logic, philosophers, uh, more touching on the mathematics of knowledge and knowledge about knowledge. Combinatorial games study a lot of mathematical combinatorial issues that arise out of games. There's a growing area of non-Bayesian decision theory where you try to take utility theory and weaken or replace the fundamental assumptions and see if you can approximate behavior better, real behavior better, by weakening these axioms. Can you generate a theory that does a better approximation? Neural games is a very, very baby subject. It was enough to make a special issue in the journal, in my journal, in the journal that I run. But they are starting to measure what happens in the brain if you double cross somebody. What happens, in the, what happens someplace in the brain if you cooperate? You see different aspects neurologically. Of course, economic games, all subject, political games. Game engineering I'll touch on later. I think that's a growing subject. Eric already touched on it. So there is tremendous number, and more is coming. I see more people among, among linguistics, more discussions of game theory. What is the language we're using game, and how does language evolve because of the incentive considerations, sociological games, and so on. So, as I've been watching this for not as long as some people in this room, but for some time, still gray hair, so, uh, for some time, and at times I wake up and I say the whole thing is falling apart. You know, just everybody's done all kinds of models. You know, we used to have real methodology, and now anybody writes any paper in any approach they want. But sometimes I think that it's a healthy expansion. So this is, let me pose it to you at the end of this talk. If you have your opinion. Where, where is game science going? So when I grew up on the book of Luce and Reifa, I only learned two models, basically two models, the, non -co the cooperative and the non-cooperative, and I thought that's the way it is and that's the way it should be. I went to, soon after that, I went to a conference in Bielefeld that Reinhard Zelten organized. Almost everybody was talking about cooperative or non-cooperative models. Zelten started talking about the change store paradox. It was the first time he started talking. So we started already seeing some issues of bounded rationality, and he had the experimentations around it, even though experimentation go further back than this. But this was the situation then, and the situation today, as I was describing in the previous slide, is quite different. So uh, on, this, on the positive side, why we are not disintegrating, let me talk about specialization and try to convince you, as I've come to think, that specialization is unavoidable if this is to become a real science. And let's differentiate two types of specialization. One is horizontal specialization. Most of it are familiar with this. Some of us study economic games, some of us study political games, artificial, algorithmic games, and so on. More controversial and less discussed, even though it's done a lot, is a vertical specialization. And what I mean by vertical specialization is what you see in other fields. For example, if you look at probability and statistics. So probability is a highly theoretical subject. But if you want to apply it to many real life applications, there is another area which is highly related. It also studies uncertainty. But it's called statistics. And somehow these two areas are not the same. There are people who study statistics. And there are people who study probability. They know each other's fields but everybody specializes in his own, and they can accomplish goals better by, and I'll, 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 I'll view this as vertical specializations. My prejudice is to say the theory is on top, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> but vertical, put it in any order that you want. Uh, another area I'll comment a little more is physics and engineering, right? Physics is the more of the theoretical, but you need to do things to build a bridge, to fly, build a plane, things like this. You need engineers to do it. Again, there is knowledge which is mutual to the two, but it's different specialization for, to achieve practical goals. So let me take an analogy and draw a very slow parallel. It will be kind of obvious when, once you think about it, but I think it's worth drawing the parallel. So let's look at the problem of air, airplane design and operation. So physicists developed the theory of aerodynamics. Engineer 
engineers design airplanes, how do they do it? Well, they use aerodynamic theory. That's one input. They know it, and it's important. But it's far from being enough. They have a lot of experience about previously designed planes, which works, which fly, and so on, which sustain pressure, and so on. And on top of it all, they do experimentations in wind tunnels, because all of it is not enough. You still want to see how it works and try to vary things and see how it works. And then on the third type of specialty, you need somebody to fly the plane, and for that you need pilots, which is a different specialty than the other two. And these are different skills, as obviously these are different skills, and knowledge of each other is valuable. And it would be impractical to say that a physicist should also know how to design planes and should also know how to fly them. Or it would be impractical to ask the pilot to write papers, theoretical papers, in a physics journal. So we have this vertical specialization there, and everybody accepts it as natural, just how to imagine how it could be otherwise. So let's take an analogy, close, starting to be close to what Eric talked about and others. Uh, let's look at the design and play of auctions. And this is becoming to emerge as a real problem, as many people, as some people in this room have done. So game theorists have a theory of auctions. It's a theory. Uh, Roger knows theory of auctions very well, but I don't know that I would hire him to bid on my behalf. He, and he agrees, <laughs> so I... <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is, they, but they're very, they develop wonderful theory of auctions. Many, several people in this room, right? Uh, then you have to design auctions. And that's an engineering problem. How do I design an auction? Do I take somebody who knows the theory, or do I need some other knowledge? So theoretical knowledge is very important, but it helps if you know how earlier auctions performed, where they succeeded, where they failed, and so on. And that's where the behavioral areas also start to emerge because the behavioral people know how people actually play. So very similar to the airplane design, the auction design has to bring in these various skills. And finally, you have the bidders. And they have additional skills. They, they know the competitors. They know the situation. They know what's valuable. Uh, on theoretical grounds alone, you couldn't do any of that. So I think it's very similar. Uh, there have been a lot of, not a lot, but several comments lately of a very negative nature than saying, people wrote articles saying, uh, knowledge of game theory doesn't make you a be better player. Hence, game theory failed. If, if we teach course to, game theory, to people who take game theory and at the end they cannot play better than people who did not take the course, that means that game theory is useless because we are leading people to believe that what we teach them is how to strategically act better. But if I take the analogy, analogy with the physics, then it's not so damning because physicists are not very good at flying planes. I mean, just because it's physicist, I'm not even half on the plane with him. Maybe he's a pilot too. These are different skills. And just like we allow physicists to differentiate among them, maybe we should have to do the same in game theory. So uh, at the same time, when somebody is an engineer, you make him study the theory of physics, of aerodynamics. And even a pilot, you make him study the theory of aerodynamics because they are better engineers and they are better physicists. So there is uh, enhancement of one's performance by learning these skills. And I have the experience of teaching a lot of executive students game theory, and they find it very beneficial, even though it's highly theoretical. When they go back, their thinking about the, inter the strategic issues is enhanced. Let's discuss a little more details, past and present, mostly present, I think there have been so many in the past, applications of game theory, just to see how it relates to this previous discussion. And I want to differentiate between theoretical versus real-life applications. Now, this, this differentiation is not, as, as most classifications, is not precise. Many things are in between. But I want to still look at two extremes just to see where we are in terms of applications, where we are good and what we need in order to go further. So let me start with theoretical applications. And I think game theory has been mostly successful in theoretical applications, or very, quite successful. So, uh, well, all the Nobel Prizes, that seven by now, right? 
game theorist won in economics. Apparently, either we pulled one over or apparently economics thinks that it's <laughs> really useful and they really understand better how to do things. Uh, where I see it, and there are many political scientists around me that do game theory, I see a revolution happening in political science in the same way that it took place uh, in economics before. And as I said before, computer science, I mean, the just tremendous num amount of activity in computer science. Uh, and then you see applications, theoretical applications, question in, questions in mathematics, questions in philosophy, questions in evolutionary biology that are all touching and relating back and forth with game theory. So the, the language and the way of thinking and the findings of game theory contribute to these theoretical fields. So these are applications to other theories. It's applications in game theory, but it's not applications of real life. It's applications to other theories. There are things in between, uh, like policy issues, you know. Policy issues in economics, is it a real life application or is it theoretical applications? This, there's these other kind of things that are in between. Real world applications, this is more upcoming now. Uh, and there aren't as many as theoretical applications. Uh, one area that seems to be doing well is market design, like, you know, kidney exchange, mar market for kidney exchange, or markets for various other things like this, where the design allows you to construct a market where the difficulties of game theory, which I'll get to later, the difficulties of Nash equilibrium or Bayesian equilibrium doesn't come up as much because if you can design markets where the behavior the required behavior is of a dominant strategy rather than Nash equilibrium, then you escape a lot of the difficulties that are assumed in the Nash equilibrium. So there have been some successes in market design. Cooperative game theory is also more useful in some particular ways. I'll give you an example. One consulting job I had uh, many years ago was, was with Arthur Anderson when they were still good. So. <laughs> And the question was how to devise a profit sharing formula to the Arthur Anderson partners. And if you know Arthur Anderson, this is a very big, there are lots of money and a lot of partners, and it's a very touchy issue. Non cooperative game theory could have not approached this subject. I mean, what are you going to do? Write the games of what every partner in every country may do and write a prior over what all their preferences. That's just not even close. Trying to take a Shapley value to this problem seemed reasonable because Shapley value is monotonicity property, different than the monotonicity before, and it gives everybody incentive to contribute because what he will contribute will bring him back at least as much as his effort. So you could take a Shapley value approach to a problem like this, and there are many problems of this type. At Cornell, there was the telephone billing system that Shapley value was used for. The problem with cooperative game theory is it's still too far from being useful because it's highly non-dynamic for the most part, and most applications change with time. It, for the most part, there are several people who have been working on it, but for the most part, it's highly uh, deterministic, so there's no uncertainty. And if you look at Arthur Anderson and like, problems like this, you really don't know a lot of the information. And the the computational issues are overwhelming, especially when you go to a problem of a manageable or real, real, real world size. So cooperative game theory has useful formulas, but they are not rich enough or too complicated to use in many applications. Uh, another example that I find surprising that doesn't get much more attention is chess playing programs. Somehow game theorists stay the this seems like maybe when the chess playing program took first, you know, won the world champ or beat the best player in the world, seemed to me like game theory should have been up and down. Hey, wow, look at game theory. But of course, it wasn't done by game theorists as the subject is divided. But it's done by people who, by game scientists, I, just, I should say, or game engineers, because they were trying to figure out how do we build a chess program that wins. It seems like a real important game theoretic question how to play a game optimally. Uh, and they developed a bunch of techniques. I'll, I'll come back to it shortly. But there's a, a nice application. application. 
but of course, difficulties are to be expected, and if we can take a sort of make our life easier by, easier by boring the physicists, the physicists, what they do, every problem they cannot solve, they say, well, that's an engineering problem. <laughs> so I think, they say, well, how to play chess optimally? That's an engineering problem, you know, so. Uh, but, and, but we do have an emerging field of game engineering, I think. So I just put here a few names of people I happen to talk to at the time who do some consulting of this type. Uh, and Bob Wilson, Milgram, Al Ross, some of my friends. I know Bill Moore does some we haven't talked about. I'm not sure you're endorsing what I'm going to say, but uh, uh, some of my Israeli friends. And what you see these people do, for the most part, there is no off-the-shelf tool that you can take down and apply. But these people have thought a lot about these subjects, just like aeronautical engineers have thought, have thought about mm -hmm. a lot, or the, the aeronautical scientists have thought about, uh, about uh, aeronautic science. And therefore, they are more capable in trying to put together a good design of an auction. Having thought about it theoretically makes you a better engineer if you go to apply it as an engineer. So there is an emerging field, I think, and the more we'll see applications of game theory, this game engineering will become a very important subject within game science. Uh, so what are some engineering tools that we have? I want to say that what we need is really something like probability theory and statistics are tied together nicely because they came up with a nice model called, called regression. Regression is beautiful. It's grounded well in theory, and it's very closely related to application, so you can apply it. We don't have a regression type of tool in game theory. We're very nice. Uh, we have something, game, game and strategy tree. So I remember when Tom Schelling talked in, I missed the talk yesterday, but I guess you referred again. What is, the important, what is an important contribution of game theory? It's being able to write a payoff matrix enable you to think much more clearly of the situation. I find being able to write a game tree, even if I'm not optimizing and finding Nash equilibrium, just being able to describe the model when I do consulting as a game tree, very useful. These are very useful tools, even though they are not that deep mathematically. Uh, so that's what we need to find much more. Computer scientists do a lot of tree trimming how do I trim the tree? Because the problem with game trees are huge, too big to handle. And also the, the whole subject is how to trim it down. Uh, so we need, but the, the problem is, is we need to remove theoretical barriers. We need engineering tools that are grounded in the theory. And we really need several major breakthroughs to come to where probability and statistics are. So let me change the subject a little and specialize the discussion now to one issue that comes up a lot. And let me talk about bounded, what has come to be called bounded rationality. I have come to some resist the term, so let me be a little more specific. Let me talk about rational players with bounded ability, okay? Bounded rationality has become a license for people to write any behavior they want, makes sense or not, proof theorem, they say this doesn't make any sense, players wouldn't play like this. Well, that's bounded rationality. So <laughs> this is sometimes goes too far. So I want to talk about rational players where we specify in what way they are bounded, and then there'll be rational subject to their bounds. And there is a nice book recently published by, edited by some philosopher where 20 senior game theorists were asked about the most important problems that game theory faces. And repeatedly, many people in this book viewed the bounded problem, let me call it bounded rationality for sure. The problem of bounded rationality is one of the most important problems now, problem nowadays. So let me make a few comments about bounded rationality. And related very closely to it, I put the highly specified because the highly specified is very important because once it's highly specified, then you know what they are doing. So not best responding to it seems silly. I mean, at least if it's bounded behavior, but I don't know how they play, I can justify all kinds of behavior. But if I know how they play, why should I not play optimally against it 
if there is a way to optimally respond. So a related question is at what micro or macro level should the games be modeled? And I'll do an example to illustrate. But in general, there are at least three problems with bounded rationality. One is that optimization may be more difficult under constraints. The first time I heard this argument from Zelten, he said, well, we're trying to model boundedly rational players, so they, are, they have, com they have uh, constraints, they can do everything. So they have to find the best thing to do subject to their constraints. But that's a much more difficult problem than just finding the best thing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you call them, you know, bounded. Now they are, you are put, imposing a much bigger job on them. And then there was a very nice series of papers by Papa Dimitri where he actually formalized this and proved theorems showing that uh, this is difficult. Uh, another related question is when to stop computing. Suppose I have a you know, finite computing time. I start computing. Com when do I stop? Because I don't know how close I am to the optimality. And that's an issue that we don't, I don't know that people have a good way to deal with. And the last question, the last issue that I want to elaborate a, a little more about now is hierarchies of knowledge about knowledge make the modeling of computational limitations difficult, unlike in physics. So um, if in physics, the, we could say, well, we want to design a plane. We have a theory of how molecules interact with each other. So I know what will happen when they hit the plane, and I can compute all the differential equations. I think Don could maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I could design a plane based on this computation of all the differential equations, physicists will say. Okay? There are better shortcuts to this problem. We have to take more of a macro approach to this problem. Uh, in game theory, the problem is that if you put some bounds, so if several of, several, of, several of us play and you put some bounds on my ability, the other player needs to know what bounds are imposed on my ability. Moreover, I need to know what he thinks are my limitations. And we have the all infinite hierarchies of descriptions of limitations on limitations. And the problem first becoming too difficult to model or to, to, for players to really act like this. And conceptually, it becomes very non-believable that you know, I know exactly the limitations and you know my knowledge, right, and so on. So there are three major difficulties in overcoming the problem of bounded rationality. Let me take an analogy from a simpler subject, and that will help me highlight some of the issues. So let me look at the problem of betting on a coin. So imagine that we are going to toss, toss a coin, and I have to bet heads or tails. Uh, and let me take a ridiculous extreme just to illustrate the point. Compare two things. Suppose there was a physicist who knew the differential equation but didn't know anything about probability. And he would say, oh, betting on a coin is easy. I'll compute for you. You tell me where the coin is on the table. You tell me how hard you eat it. You tell me the wind velocity in the rooms. Tell me the hardness coefficient on the table on which it's going to bounce. And I'll solve the equation, and I'll tell you if it's going to fall heads or tails. Sounds theoretically plausible, but not practically plausible. And a breakthrough comes when you start talking about probabilities. Rather than asking where the coin is going to fall, let's ask a more limited question and let's say what are the chances that it's going to fall heads or tails? Or in the long run, what frequency will we see heads and tails rather than trying to predict with certainty the next, uh, the next uh, outcome? But this is a major breakthrough in decision theory, the idea of probability. And I'm leading to say that we don't have this kind of major breakthroughs to simplify our problems. So micro versus macro again. So the macro level of the probability seems more appropriate for the gambling problem. At least I think casinos will think so. They will not hire. I don't know any casinos that hire physicists to <laughs> <laughs> compute what the slot machine will do. Uh, now game theorists bring probabilities. In, we do bring probabilities into our model. We are all well educated, by, but often at an unrealistic micro level. So let me make fun of this a little bit. And I'm guilty of it as anybody else in this room, maybe more, so I'm not making, I'm, you know. But if you took a newly graduating PhD student from a game theory course and say, well, let's compute, we are going to bet on a coin. Tell me what to do. 
You say, well, we are going to compute how the coin is going to fall. I say, well, but we don't know the wind velocity in the wind. We don't know how hard you're going to hit it. We don't know all these things. Well, we'll put a prior probability distribution on when you're going to start. We'll put a prior probability distribution on all the wind velocities. We'll pick priors on everything. And then we will compute in every state how the, using physics differential equations, how the coin is going to fall. And then we'll integrate over the states. And we have the best thing to bet upon. Uh, I'm making it ridiculous. I mean, I'm taking it to a ridiculous extreme, but I think there is a, this kind of stuff that's going on now. It's over, my, it's too micro. We are trying to model things too much to the details that in many cases are really not realistic. It, it's like trying to do this on the coin. So, but the choice of micro versus macro is a difficult choice. So let me stay with the coin again. If I flip the coin really high, I will take the macro. I would just say, what is the frequency? But if somebody said the coin is here and somebody is going to hit it very lightly, I will start doing the micro probabilities. I'll start saying, well, what is the probability will hit it harder than this or that? So at a very simple level, I will take the micro approach. Otherwise, I'll take the macro approach. And the trick is probably, and maybe we'll never get around it, what happens in between? When do I switch from micro to macro approach? And I think that's something that game theorists have to wrestle with. Herb Robbins used to talk the coin very, very high. And when people asked him why, he said, give God a chance to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, and there is a professor of mathematics at Harvard, what's his name? Uh, uh, the formula, the uh, Greek name, who knows how to flip what he wants. I mean, uh, that, yeah, yeah, he can flip, the, he can shuffle, yeah. He's a sensor now, yeah. <laughs> now, Problems become easier when ability bounds are common knowledge. Then it's easier to deal with ability bounds because then I don't have the issue of the hierarchy. So like very similar to what uh, Harsani did with incomplete information, so let's put a prior. He did not say it, but everybody uses it. Let's say the, the prior is a common prior, and then I don't have all the hierarchies of what he thinks about what I think because we all think the same. So if I look at ability bounds that are of common knowledge, then we can deal with it better because everybody maximizes subject to this ability bound bit. So let me show you some example of ability bounds that are common knowledge that are helpful. Okay, and this will give me a chance a little bit to discuss something that I'm, really, I'm involved in. So uh, let's talk about an, an assumption that I will call bounded payoff perception. So let's talk about payoff tables. Let's think of two-person game, finite two-person game, so payoff table. And put numbers in this payoff table. Now, I can say let's put, let's restrict ourselves to numbers with a finite number of finite expansion. So we'll go up to 16 decimals. Okay. I don't think there's any experiment or anybody will say that if I change the 17th decimal, my behavior will change. If you put three people in the lab, they basically hardly even react to <laughs> one versus two. But uh, I could go with much less. I could restrict myself to, to numbers that have finite descriptions. So you can throw in pies and all kinds of numbers. Right? But let's, let's just for simplicity assume that pay, if you don't like 16 decimal, go to 100 decimal. Let's assume that payoff tables are specified only to 16 decimals. Players don't have perception of difference in outcome beyond the 16 decimal. If I take this assumption, then nice, nice things happen. So I want to discuss two impossibility results and see how they change if you assume that players only respond, only perceive of payoffs up to the 16 decimal. So there is a paper, nice, very nice paper by Foster and Young in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science published in 2001. And it's called on the impossibility of predicting the behavior of rational agents. Let me tell you what it is. It deals with the question of can, do we learn to play Nash equilibrium in a Bayesian repeated game? So now to some people this means clear, very clear what it is. Let me try to describe to others who are not. So what is a Bayesian repeated game? So we're going to play repeatedly a two-person payoff. There is a payoff table. We're going to play it repeatedly. It's a repeated game. Uh, 
and we'll be getting every time, you know, choose left, bo top, bottom, left, right, and we'll get the pair, the pair of payoffs, if there are two players, the pair of payoffs in the cell that is played similar to the example that Eric had. Uh, but suppose there is no information about each other's payoff tables. I know my payoffs in every circumstance. I don't know my opponent's payoff. He knows, she, she knows her payoff, she doesn't know mine. Okay, so this, but the same pair of payoff tables, the same payoff table will be used repeatedly. It's just that I know my part of it and she knows her part of it. We don't know each other's. Okay. So if I take a Nash equilibrium of this repeated game, this is called a Bayesian repeated game. If I take Bayesian equilibrium or Nash equilibrium of this Bayesian repeated game, then I choose a strategy for my type, for my, pay, for my payoff table, when I know my payoff table, I choose a strategy which is optimal, not against the strategy that she's using as a function of her payoff table, but against the distribution of strategies that she uses because she may be of these many different types. Am I making any sense? Uh, and similarly, her strategy is not best response to my strategy because she doesn't know what payoff table I have and therefore how I play, but it's the distribution of my types. And we play the games like this, but every period we see what, what each other did. And as we see which, what each other did, we can start saying, oh, it's probably because she's of this type payoff table or that payoff table. So try trying to make a Bayesian updating on what her payoff table is given the actions that she took and vice versa. So the question is, if we start with the Bayesian equilibrium of this type and we start playing, will we converge with time to play as if we know each other's payoff table? We can't learn each other's playoff because maybe the payoff tables are the same or don't make any difference. But would we learn to play as if we know each other's payoff table? And the impossibility result of uh, Foster and Young says that they found one game, they illustrated, something. they illustrated it with one game where this fails. And with a fairly quite easy argument I can present it. Uh, on the other hand, if I look at bounded payoff perception and look at the same question exactly, then there is a paper of Eud Lehrer and myself from 1993 where you get a possibility result. It says with time, you will learn to play. So take a Bayesian equilibrium, with time you learn to play as if you knew each other's payoff. And the difference here lies on whether you have a finite number of times or types or infinitely many types. If you have finitely many types or finite payoff perception, then you get possibility result. Infinitely many types, if you have to be sensitive to any infinite variation in the payoffs, then I can deconstruct an impossibility uh, result. I think the impossibility result is maybe also too far reaching, but we can get away from this difficulty if we are willing to assume that uh, finite payoff perception. Uh, where you start with the prior over the payoff table, and then it's a Bayesian equilibrium. So because it's a Bayesian equilibrium, because it's a Bayesian equilibrium, after I see what you've done, and since I know what every one of your types will do, I can, with time, eliminate types and shrink your possible types. So every time I have a sharper prediction, so to speak, on what you will do because I'm, you are one of the types that are not eliminated and the, the set of possible types is reduced and eventually it will become close enough that it will converge to the best responding. So you really more than that. You'll not, not just learn to play Nash equilibrium. After a while, you'll learn to predict what the opponent will do more and more accurately. And because you learn to predict what the other player will do more and more accurately, you'll be best responding to what they actually do. And that's how you get to Nash. Let me show you another example that, was been, that has been pushed a lot in the literature recently. And this is a series of paper by, papers by Hart and Mas Collet. And they looked for what they call uncoupled dynamics. Can uncoupled dynamics lead to Nash equilibrium? Uh, uncoupled, uh, in economics terms, sometimes it's called decentralized. Okay, but that's the terminology. So are there uncoupled learning algorithms that lead to Nash equilibrium in a repeated play of a normal form game? So it's very similar to the one I just described. So suppose I have a normal form game that is going to be played repeatedly. I have to come up with a strategy. I know my payoff table. 
and I have to come up with a strategy how to play the game repeatedly as I observe the actions of my opponent and as a function of knowledge of my own type. Can I find some way to play that's good? And can my opponent in a similar situation find a way that's good for her to play? And can we find two such functions that with time will converge to Nash equilibrium? Okay, so we don't start with a prior. Can we find such two functions that will converge necessarily with time to Nash equilibrium? Uncoupled here, and that's the thing I want to emphasize, uncoupled here means that my strategy depends on knowledge of my own payoff and observing the history, but cannot rely on knowledge of my opponent's payoff. I can only act on my own knowledge. And the same thing for her. She can only act on knowledge of her payoff table and not assume anything about knowledge of mine. So it's really, if, it were, if we could get something like this, that would be very nice because we don't want to assume that we know about each other. And indeed, they prove an impossibility result in the AER that this is impossible to get processes that converge to uncoupled processes that converge to a Nash dynamics. Now, that was surprising to me because if I look at the same paper as I mentioned before of Lehrer and myself, I can construct what seemed to me to be uncoupled dynamic that converged to Nash equilibrium along exactly the same lines. So Sergio and I went back and forth at it and finally we clarified it's kind of easy to see. If we all know that all that matters is the payoffs up to the six, if we cannot perceive payoffs beyond the 16 decimal, and we assume this on each other, we just coupled our knowledge, our dynamics, right? Because now I know, if I knew that Roger cannot perceive of things beyond the 16 decimal, then I know something about his preferences. So if there is common knowledge that players perceive up to 16 decimal, we coupled our learning processes, and then we are into the possibility result that I can create easily through the Kalai Lehrer paper. Uh, and that kind of gave me some light that we sometimes fall into these assumptions easily. I say, uncoupled, that sounds very appealing, but coupled could be very minimal. All I need to know is that players don't look beyond the 16 decimal. I know something about it. That's, that's excluded under the strict definition of uncoupled dynamics. So I'm bringing it because I want to discuss my own work, but also because I want to point to the type of restrictions that are bounded ability but are easier to accept. To me, the assumptions that players don't look beyond the 16 decimal is a bounded ability, but it's of a common knowledge type. I think I would buy it as a common knowledge type, and then I can get possibility results rather than impossibility. It's still very far from trying to solve the big problems that I was trying to present before, but uh, that's um, on. Yeah, there's discounting. It's true for every discount parameter. Yes, exactly. But if I can't do the research, how am I going to be playing? No, no. So I'm just assuming games always come up. The, all the games in the world come up to 16 decimal. This is the all, okay. yeah. These are all the games that we are considering. Is that, I'm trying to figure out why that makes a difference. Is it because there's common knowledge? I mean, once we're, we've been studying for millions of years, it's common knowledge that at the beginning of the game we weren't worrying about what happened here because that was so discounted. Or I mean, what that, yeah, what, why does this make a difference? Tech, tech? Well, technically, it makes it puts me in a finite discrete world instead of a continuum of. So here I have a conti both in a, in a Young and Foster and Young and in Hart and Mascolet, there is a continuum of types, and I'm dealing in a discrete world where there's a finite. So the assumption of grain of truth, for example, holds. So what the time it takes to learn must be of more must be longer. No, but there's. there's the kind of things that they were looked at, there is a discontinuity between the finite and the infinite. Because otherwise, as you suggest, it will be done, right? But uh, there is, I, I yeah. So the price of money is not related to the strength of the company, it's got to be an epsilon connection that it must have one of the epsilon. Uh, well, 
Wait, are you, which more are we in the, uh, the negative or the positive? Of, uh, of, how, of the fixed investment. Yes. That's a very weak coupling. Does that mean it converges, but it takes a very slow convergence to fix? Uh, the rate of learning is very complicated. It's actually a fascinating subject, and it's very complicated. I'll tell you why. Let me show you that it's really difficult. Suppose the two of us play, Simon. So you and I play. I have a real payoff table, but you're indifferent between everything. Can be, right? So you can do any crazy thing that you want, and it'll be optimal on your part. You pay the zero no matter what. Okay? So by doing this artificial construct, I can now construct all kinds of strategies convenient for me to show why the question that you're asking is difficult. If you're indifferent between everything, suppose you play the same thing uh, for a million times, and on the million and first, suppose you play top for a million times, and on a million and first you go bottom, and then back up. And another one of your types may play a million times, a billion times top, bottom, and then go back. I need to predict to learn how you're going to play. Both of them are rational in your part. It's not going to help me, right? It's going to take me a million steps before I know if you are the first type that deviates after a million or the second type that deviates after a billion. So it's going to take me a million times, period, before I can learn to predict what you will do so I can best respond to you, right? Uh, and I can push this million as much as I want. So learning time is very difficult. That's on the negative side. On the positive side, if you're not going to play different between your two types for a million periods, there's no need to learn. Right? Because a million times I know what you're going to do. It's, you're not giving it away. So the question of how long it takes to learn can be viewed negatively, but if you look at it more carefully, it's really not as bad. And Sylvain Soren and I think uh, Drew Fiedenberg and several other people have some nice results that show this contrast. So discussing how long is hard in this kind of... So finally... Are we going for this in disintegration or a healthy expansion? Any opinions that you appreciate? <laughs> 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 time to argue uh, for an area called decision science instead of game science. Okay. But you're leaving out as all those problems involving one person with one person acting with committees and it's the, there's a lot of stuff that would be common. I somehow made a, a, a mental estimate of the number of uh, lines on your slides that would be appropriate for a talk called decision science. And it comes out to about 38%. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I accept, I'm not, I don't know, Bob's title is game theory, <laughs> decision theory, something like that, right? Is that related to? No. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but there's still the, the interactive aspect at some point. When oh, you have the physicists and you have the engineers. Yeah. The oh, engineers. yes, yes. And you have the problem of teaching people and how they learn. And right. I agree. Experiments. Sure. Right. Yeah. I conceive of a possibility that in 20 years' time in major universities, there will be a department of decision science. That would be great. I mean, and hopefully a subgroup that studies game theory. With it. <laughs> well, that would, uh, in my view, the game theory is a subsumes this, is it how people should act and do act, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Acting as individuals interactively as a game theory. Oh, okay, yes. Collegially as in bargaining and negotiation yeah. theory. Would you rather call the subject interactive decision theory or just leave the interaction part out of the name? That's good. That's good. Hey, yeah. It belongs to a department of decision science. Manager of economics and decision, decision science. Sciences. It doesn't help us get students. <laughs> 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 Not among the MBAs. <laughs> Any other? Thank you.
chapter two direction. Right, uh, I totally agree. And the, the cheat sheet to the MBA, the more intellectual ones, and lots of the research. So I, my department is schizophrenic. I mean, the research is very good. The teaching is, we serve these MBAs. So for example, the Gilboa, Gilboa Schmeidler papers on alternatives, decision, utility theory, kind of decision making, was all created there and stuff like this. So the department does value this a lot, yes. Well, I'm just wondering, um, in decision analysis classes, since we're talking about utility theory, uh, we do have software that's publicly available that's used in consulting firms for constructing decision trees with single outcomes like money you know, or multiple objectives. Um, are there such software tools available for teaching game theory or for consulting in game theory? I, I think that maybe I vaguely remember people in sending me stuff and saying they have stuff, but I can't. Gamut. Gamut. Yeah. Um, we're just being managed from now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Charlie Holt has a bunch of stuff here. Yeah. 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 It's basically one of those things that I think is very useful is that people all over the world now are using different kinds of decision tree software. Now, I can sometimes debate. A lot of people use analytic hierarchy process, and maybe I'd say that's not the theoretical foundation I want. But you have widespread use, or yes. at least knowledge and attempted use. Uh, of the tools because uh, it's made. This tool, I, several consulting jobs I did, and I know others that I've talked to, find the decision <coughs> tree as a fantastic tool to communicate and discuss back and forth uh, for a uh, lot of people here too. But uh, then you move to a game tree. And if you talk to people who work for corporations to move into the information sets and things like this becomes a little pushing it. Uh, but I find that, so one, I worked with some MBAs at uh, Baxter, and they came up with the idea, oh, let's build a decision tree of the opponent so we can put the yeah. probabilities. So we started playing with this kind of idea. So there is a difference between decision tree and what's the next idea of a game tree that's usable and available, uh, you know, meaningful to users, would be a very nice uh, theoretical advance. Uh, Tom, do you have anything? No, I wanted to suggest in computer science, they use multi-agent influence diagrams, mm -hmm. which is a very compact yes. representation. That's right. And mm -hmm. there's a woman at Stanford, Daphne Kohler, who has programs that, well, they can convert the rules of a game into a game tree. They can convert, represent a game in, as a multi-agent influence diagram, and then use that as a computational engine for things like equilibrium. The, the computer scientists are way ahead of us on this. So yes. People, really, it's really true that they have a much more compact and efficient representation. Yeah, that's partly what you're talking Roger's about. Roger's shaking his head. Right? The, uh, the basic problem is equilibrium analysis is, 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 so, well. is so difficult mathematically. No, no, no. They, they, it's and just, I'm telling you about the equilibrium. Unfortunately, all your influence, now, now you've got arrows between everything. Once you have, uh, once you go to correlation, you simplify the equilibrium mathematics. That gives you an arrow in everywhere, and influence diagrams aren't so good when everything's arrowed. Okay, so let me explain. A multi agent influence diagram says wherever there's not an arrow, yeah, right. it's independent. There's yeah. no influence. Right. So that's right. the operating assumption. But for so much of what people, you know, real models, the, the independence that's assumed in all these places, if you have a representation that assumes that automatically instead of having to code it in, then you get a much more compact representation. Also, information sets are represented by these contingency tables, which is computationally the way, almost the way you have to do it anyway. So that's more efficient. These are called maids. M A I D. I hope you can get your terminology 
disseminated widely because I've had trouble for two years explaining the difference between Johnny Almond and me. Yes. He's a game <laughs> theorist. The problem is game theory already has the word theory in it. Yes. You can't, you, in statistical theory, there's statisticians. In economic theory, there are economists. Yes. But we don't have a word like gameology. Yes. And <laughs> game science makes good sense. Uh, I, I wish you would choose either game scientist or game engineer. Yes. Stick to one or the other and do what you can to propagate it. Because, <laughs> because if this language had been available 30 years ago, it would have avoided a lot of confusion. Thank you. I've been pushing, I've been actually having arguments, and thanks to you, you gave a talk and made the same point in, uh, in the, uh, the game theory in New York, in the Stony Brook. Oh, yeah. And you, you, you made this point, and it helps. And uh, I think, I mean, actually, there's a debate going in the game theory society. Somebody's not talking about start, starting a journal called Game Science. Except for one problem, which Francis Crick pointed out, that any subject that's got the word science in its name is extremely I know. I, I heard the same science. from several people, but computer science is doing pretty well. Oh, I said to computer, and even a computer scientist said to me, we don't like to, to, to be called computer science. I asked him, would you rather go back to computing theory? He said, no. <laughs> so, for lack of better, so maybe game engineering. I, I like game science. It's broader, I think. But uh, I don't see a better. I, I agree, but I wish there was a gameology. But yeah. and if ludology is not something you want, I mean, I looked at Greek and uh, all, all kinds of you know. So why don't you just take over the term sociology? <laughs> <laughs> sociology.